All right. Well, you raise your hand first. At Yelta, I mean, I've, I, I know a couple of your names now, but you know, I'm just going to point. So, yeah, please. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to answer that. As it, in, in case you, you didn't hear the question, I, the, the question was, uh, in my book, Living in God's Two Kingdoms, I'm uh, critical of this idea of cultural transformation. And so um, what's that all about? So uh, I try to make a, 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 an important distinction. Um, when I... When I speak against the idea, or when I write against the idea of transformation, uh, it's specifically a redemptive transformation. Uh, and so uh, I, I argue, and I, I hope you could see the, the, the logic of my saying this, uh, if you've heard these three lectures, is that I don't believe Christians are called to try to transform the institutions of the world to conform them to Christ's heavenly redemptive kingdom. All right, so I don't think that it is Christ's redemptive kingdom that is to serve as the model for civil government or the model for our economic order, etc. Now, I would say, in fact, I would say very strongly that we are called as Christians to pursue what is good in our in our societies, in our, in our culture, our broader culture, to, to pursue what is good in the workplace, to try to pursue excellence, to try to love our neighbors, uh, through these various things we do. And so that may mean, in a way, that we are transforming in the sense that if we are, if you have a government job and you're promoting a little bit more justice than otherwise would, that's... We might say that's a tran- that's transformation. If you're working in a business and you're making a little bit better product, um, there's a certain kind of transformation that may take place. Um, but what I would argue is that don't uh, don't try to transform your workplace or your civil government according to the model of Christ's heavenly kingdom. That's not the model. And the, the reason why I bring up that question, uh, some of you may be uh, aware of this and others probably aren't, but there's th- this, this language of transformation is used by a lot of people, and it's used in a way of saying, uh, we want to see Christ's kingdom manifest, revealed everywhere. So civil government is then manifesting the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, as our churches are. And so that's the kind of view that I'm trying to get to to get away from. Well, obviously, we're not creating hope. We cannot create hope. Right. 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 Try, yes, I mean, we, we have to give up utopian kinds of dreams, right? That, the Lord doesn't promise us that in this present age. Um, but we are called to, be, to try to make this world more just. And, and that is, I would say, that we look back to the Noahic Covenant as, or even back be, before that to the creation order to, to, to say that this is what we're striving for, um, we're not striving to bring the kingdom of God here uh, in, our, in our political work. And so uh, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. 
Um, well, I, you know, I think that there's, uh, whenever you have uh, isms, <laughs> I think we always need to be alert to what is, you know, is there some kind of driving philosophy here? Uh, and uh, certainly, you say Marxism is a kind of a philosophy. It's quite an explicitly non-Christian philosophy. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's materialistic for one thing. We as Christians certainly must oppose that, and it has a kind of an eschatology, uh, in the sense that it is holding out hope for a kind of a humanly contained utopia in this present world, and that's something that we as Christians cannot we cannot embrace. And so in that sense, I say, you know, Christians can't be Marxists, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean we couldn't acknowledge that Marx or some Marxists had insights on certain parts of human life, but we can't be Marxists, for sure. Now, it's interesting. I mean, you mentioned capitalism, and you know, that raises the question, what exactly is capitalism? I think for many people, capitalism is also, it's a philosophy, and it's it could be seen as a non-Christian philosophy insofar as it, if it turns into a kind of um, a glorific, a consumerism, a materialism um, that, that glorifies human wealth. And, I mean, capitalism can also take on certain utopian um, overtones as well. And so I think we as Christians need to be alert to that as well. Now, if you're asking me about economics more, more generally, I do think that a, a, a kind of a free market model is more consistent with all sorts of moral considerations that we as Christians ought to appreciate, grounded in the Noahic Covenant, than um, what we might think of as a more socialist uh, model. Um, but I would say there, you know, w- w- once we start getting into the details, and I'd say, you know, I have some strong opinions on these things, but I want to be very careful about putting out my opinions on the details of public policy as somehow it's the Christian view that all Christians, you know, have to agree with me or else they're being unfaithful as believers. So um, as a general matter, yes, I think, I think there's a lot to say for free markets. How that gets worked out, you know, we can have very legitimate debates about that and hopefully continue to acknowledge each other as brothers and sisters and worship alongside each other even if we have some disagreements on certain economic issues. Yes, Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a good question, and I think, uh, I, I think a challenging question in, in many ways. It, it, yeah, it, it's, I, I've certainly, I, I would say that in, in my lectures here, I've been, I've been emphasizing the distinction uh, in God's work, God's common grace, his special grace, his, the Noahic covenant and, and the new covenant. I think those are very important. Um, I didn't talk as much about, I, I acknowledge, but I didn't talk as much about the fact that there is, in overarching unity to God's plan in this world. And if we had more time, ideally, I would talk more about that. And I think one of the things that we would wanna, we'd want to think about is the fact that uh, there are ways in which these two kingdoms, these two rules of God, can and do support each other. And so the church exercises the keys of the kingdom. It doesn't want to, it should not give those keys to any other institution, and yet we recognize that the church depends upon other institutions in certain ways. Um, the church has an interest in civil government acting appropriately. Um, when civil government does its work, it protects the church. It provides a peaceful environment for the church to work. The church depends on the economic life of the world. Um, it wants its members to have jobs and to be able to support themselves and to, to, to support the church and, and its work. Um, so in... in those are just a couple of examples, but uh, you know there there are there are many important questions uh, about how 
the two kingdoms, the institutions of the two kingdoms, support each other. Now, I take it your question is a little bit different from what I've just been talking about in that there are some institutions that maybe don't fit clearly into one or the other. And uh, let's see, you, you mentioned uh, yeah, parachurch organizations and even seminaries, like the seminary where I teach. And um, I think, you know, maybe I could just focus on seminaries for a moment since it's something I think about, since I draw my, uh, my paycheck from, from a seminary. And to be perfectly honest, I've, 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 I've wondered sometimes, would it be better if we, as, as Presbyterian Reformers in the United States, would it be better if we trained our pastors in church-run seminaries rather than independent seminaries? Now, with, as, as, as you know, I mean, through, through a number of quirks in, in history, not all, but most training of Confessional Presbyterian Reform ministers takes place in independent schools, not in church-run schools. I think if, if it was a church-run, if the Orthodox Presbyterian Church had Machen Theological Seminary or something, um, we, we, you probably wouldn't have asked this question. But although it actually might, might, might raise uh, uh, similar questions. I guess I would say this. Um, I, I think we can make a case that, that, that education is something for the entire human race. We, don't, we wouldn't say that unbelievers ought not to have schools. Uh, learning is something that, in many respects, we, sh- we can share in common with uh, uh, unbelievers. And so uh, I do think that as, as human beings develop schools for the various purposes, uh, human beings have certain liberty to... Um, uh, to, to, to form those schools in ways that are promote the purposes for which those schools are formed. Uh, a school designed for engineering is going to have promote engineering sorts of things. A school, a law school, is going to promote legal uh, uh, studies. And um, it seems to me that as as Christians form schools, and of course Christians form all all sorts of kinds of schools. They form Christian grade schools and high schools and colleges. And I, I, I think that uh, Christians have a liberty to, uh, as other human beings do, to, to develop schools uh, according to their um, uh, uh, the purposes uh, for, for which they're founded. So I would say, I, maybe I'm, I'm kind of wandering off from, uh, from the, the precise topic, I, I would say that if you ask me about Westminster Seminary, California, about the other Reformed seminaries in this country, I would say that look, they have been, uh, they're part of God's common kingdom. I, I mean, I, I would say that the, um, we have, uh, we've organized the schools along the lines of other forms of higher education. We have accreditation from overarching uh, secular, uh, not, not only, but it, it, we, we have uh, secular organizations that accredit us. We give degrees. Uh, we teach some subjects that are taught in other kinds of institutions, like learning languages, learning history, learning philosophy. At the same time, I would say that uh, we have some very unique things that go on at the seminary. Uh, it, when I get into the classroom, I don't think of myself just as someone having an ordinary occupation. I think of myself as a minister of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church trying to communicate uh, the scriptures. So I would see... Uh, I would see our, our seminary as an institution of the common kingdom that has some very important goal, that, some important role in helping the church and serving the church. And whether or not that's the ideal way to train pastors, I, I just I want to be honest and say I'm not sure that's the ideal way. I'm not sure exactly what the ideal way is. There are, sometimes there are problems that emerge when churches form seminaries, and part of the reason we have independent seminaries is because of problems in denominational seminaries, as you know. <laughs> so um, I think seminaries are a very interesting test case, and I'm not entirely always sure what to say about them. <laughs> uh, you asked about something else. Oh, medical missions. Yeah, this is, this is also uh, interesting. Um, I'll, I'll try to be a lot shorter uh, on this one. Um, I am 
I, I guess you can put me in the camp of being skeptical about churches doing mission work, or I'm sorry, doing medical work. Um, I'm in favor of Christians going out into poor areas and doing medical work. In fact, this is it's something in some ways uh, close to my own family's heart. My mother-in-law uh, is a pediatrician, and when her husband, my, my father-in-law, died about 12, 13 years ago, she, she got involved in a, in a, in a, in a Christian organization that uh, does medical work in a dozen African nations. She lived in Africa for two years and has gone back there every year. She's 80 now. And um, I, I like what they do, I think, in that this is, this is an organization that is, it, I mean, it's Christians who have gotten together and formed an organization that does this sort of thing and hires people like my mother-in-law who are competent to do medical work. Uh, it's not a work of the church, and I like that. I, 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 whether you want to call that medical missions, sometimes the whole missions thing I think can be a kind of a difficult word to use. But Christians going out and doing medical work, I say form organizations that are equipped to do that sort of thing, but probably it's not the work of the church to be, to be doing that kind of uh, labor. I, I know the Orthodox Presbyterian Church has, does a little bit of medical work in, in, in Africa, and I just... I'll leave that aside without commenting on that. I, I, but I hope that gives you a little sense of the way I would approach it. Christians should do it, but I think do it in non-ecclesiastical context. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, it's a little, it seems, yeah, I, I, I sort of hate making too many public comments about other institutions and with a lot of people I know and those, yeah, so, uh, yes, uh, I think that's a very astute observation, that they're different things, and I would say, um, whatever the ideal way to train pastors is, whatever that way is, I would, I would say, it's, it's, it's completely understandable and justifiable that churches would establish seminaries for the training of ministers. So we know that the church is responsible for, they're, they're ultimately responsible for raising up the next generation of pastors and, and uh, other ministers of, of the gospel. You defend that easily from scripture. Um, so having a church-run seminary, I think, is entirely justifiable from the scriptures. Uh, I am kind of a skeptic about church-run colleges, and it's not that I'm, I'm not a skeptic about having colleges that, you know, teach Christian truth, but I'm not sure that the church has really been ordained by the Lord Jesus Christ to be running institutions that teach biology and economics and medieval history and mathematics, those are good things. We want our young people to be studying those things. And if we want to have a Christian college, I would say have parents, have, have other leaders get together and establish these institutions. And if you want to run it from a, you know, if, from a Christian perspective, great. But I would probably I recommend that that not happen being run by the Senate or the General Assembly of... Uh, of a church. I, again, I, and I would say I, we don't ordain ministers and elders for the church because they have expertise in teaching calculus um, or teaching physics. And so they're probably not the people that are ultimately ought to be responsible for, for, uh, for overseeing that. And I say it as someone who went to a denominational college. I went to Calvin College, which is, you know, sort of uh, analogous to. to to, to covenant, yeah, 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 in that way. So, yeah, those are my thoughts on that.
Yes, sir. Yes, I, I would. I, I would. I think for, for for each of those, I think it's worth asking: Is this something we're called to as individuals, or is this something we're called to corporately, or or maybe both? And I, I think the answer is going to be different for different ones of these. Now, I would say that it, if we look at, uh, and you know, you didn't say whether you're coming from another Reformed or Presbyterian church. I, I would say that. I, I mean, I would. I would hold the traditional reformed conviction that the church does not have the, the, the church the church does not have authority to do or to say things beyond what the scriptures give it authority to do and to say and so you know that would I think some of the things I've said in my lectures point to why I think that and there, 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 there it would be be more to say so um, if we take that view, then we would say, okay, what is, what is the church called to do? Well, what, what sorts of things does, a, does Scripture give authority to the church to do? And so you mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned preaching in the Lord's Supper. So I would say, yes, I mean, very clearly, these are things that the New Testament not just gives permission, but you know, commands the church to be doing these things. And I would even say that, for, say the, the example of the Lord's Supper, this is something that is not for individual Christians to, to be doing. That w- w- when we see the theology of the Lord's Supper unpacked in the New Testament, especially in 1 Corinthians, that this is something for the body. This is something that we do as a corporate community. We don't have liberty just to, I can't do it on my own or just you know, do it with my family. And so I think the Lord's Supper is a good example of something that's clearly the church's job to do and the church's own, uh, the, the church only. Um, when it comes to, okay, when it, I think you mentioned, you, you had a long list, but you mentioned racial reconciliation and feeding the hungry. I, I, I think you mentioned both of those things. Uh, those are interesting uh, uh, cases because I, I would say that the church has some role in those things, but, it's, but I think we need to be very careful about this. I would, I, I would argue that uh, the church has given a diaconal role to the church. I think we, can, we find that very clearly in the New Testament, that we, as the church, uh, we, are to, uh, we are to show mercy to and to provide for those in need. But I would also argue, in the New Testament, that's focused upon fellow believers. Right? We're, we're not called to be a relief agency for the world in general. We're called to be providing for our brothers and sisters in need. And so I would say when it comes to feeding the hungry... We feed, we, we look after our own poor. That's what the church's diaconal ministry is about. Now, that doesn't mean that we're indifferent to, to non-Christians who are poor, but I would say that's not to be, that work is to be done in other ways. And, and here I would bring in my comments uh, to Pastor Story about um, uh, Medical work, and you know, I would see this as part of that. Is it yes? Let let let's do medical work for people in need, and and you know, help others who are poor outside the church. But let's form other organizations or work with existing organizations uh, to try to do that. And I would say, with the issue of reconciliation, I, I know that's, uh, that's a very hot issue in in some places. Here, I would say, the church has some responsibilities here, insofar as if, if the church has been, 
if the church has sinned in this matter, the church needs to, it needs to rectify its ways. The church needs, it needs to proclaim the gospel to all sorts of people. It needs to welcome all people. Uh, we can't, the, you know, the, the, the church can't make any particular person come within its doors, but it needs to open the doors and try to welcome people from all sorts of different backgrounds. Uh, and, and so in that sense, the church is engaged in the work of reconciliation. Um, that doesn't mean, I would say, that the church has responsibility to be a political action committee trying to reform police practices or whatever other thing. Now, it doesn't mean that Christians can't be interested in those things, but I would say, you know, Scripture hasn't given the church that kind of mandate to be, it hasn't given the church the kind of expertise to know exactly how to, how to run a police department. And so if, if you have interest in that, if you have expertise, go get involved, but not something that, uh, that the church uh, uh, should do. So I hope that, that, that gives at least enough of a, of a sense of kind of how I would try to, uh, try to work those things out. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. L- let me say that in, in general, I would say that beyond the, the, the particular issues of abortion or a, uh, a political authority like, like, like Hitler, that I'm, just, I, I'm, I'm generally opposed to the pastor getting up behind the pulpit and saying, you should vote X, even if it's very obvious, I would say. And the, the reason... Uh, for that is, I, I mean, I believe that what the pastor does when he's expounding the word, when he gets into the pulpit, he's expounding the word of God. And we, I think we need to be careful. And it's going to be hard to draw really bright lines here. Obviously, we, we, we do expect pastors to be trying to explain the word in ways that are relevant for the particular lives of the people who are sitting there listening to him. But I think the pastors need to be very careful about trying to get so specific that they are micromanaging the lives of their people. Like, uh, you know, what text exactly would it be that we're expounding that goes into, okay, now you need to vote. You know, we got this election coming up, so here's how you vote. So I, I would, generally speaking, I would say, I, I would be very concerned about The, the violation of my obligation as a minister of the as a minister of the Word of God, to be talking about such practical issues, such concrete issues as how you vote, as going beyond my responsibility to be, to be expounding uh, the Scriptures, and so that that's part of the overarching uh, 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 issue with respect to uh, abortion. Uh, in a way, I'm not. I'm not necessarily arguing that you know there's this hierarchy of of issues, and abortion is only here rather than here. I mean, I, I think it, to, to you, you say you know uh, what other issue could possibly be as important as abortion, and I guess if if you want me to say uh, uh, you know what about war? Um, 
that's also a Sixth Commandment issue. And sometimes war becomes a very controversial subject uh, in, our, in our politics. And war can involve the tremendous loss of life, the, the disruption of an entire society. And so, I, I mean, I, I think it's... I'm not saying, I, I, again, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to offer my particular point of view on, on a particular issue, but I could certainly see someone saying, in a particular situation, a Christian in good conscience saying, I'm very concerned about the abortion issue, but I'm also really concerned about this issue of a war, and um, there's loss of, there's this, lo, this, this life issue that is involved in both of these, and it may well be that the person that I like on one issue, I don't like on the other issue. Uh, and then I think you could say, well, it's, it, we're not arguing about whether we believe taking innocent life is, is at stake, but we're arguing about how, you know, how things are going to get worked out in this particular uh, time. So um, I would just... I, I, you asked me for an example, so I guess there's an example of something that I, I, that I think could at least be on the same level, abortion, because you have uh, Sixth Commandment issues there. Um, with respect to Hitler, yeah, this is a question that uh, comes up often. You know, what, what about Hitler? <laughs> um, you know, if you think about the first problem with the German churches, I would say, was it wasn't that they didn't speak against Hitler. The problem was that they embraced Hitler. And, you know, Hitler had this idea of this, what, the, uh, uh, the Reichskirche or something, you know, the, the, the Church of the Empire. I would say uh, the Two Kingdoms doctrine applied consistently in the German setting would have, the, the church would have said to Hitler, no, we will not be your pawn. Uh, you are not the head of the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the head uh, uh, of the church. Um, so I think on, on that level, it would have been very, uh, uh, let, let's, there weren't very many Christians in the German church of this time, so we can't really expect much of them, I suppose. But um, I think that's, that. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, well, I, you know, I wasn't saying there are no Christians, but I mean, that, this, this is a very apostate church, and so we're not surprised and, you know, so I guess I would say that if I would, again, uh, okay, if, if I was in the pulpit, you know, in that, in that setting, it's, you know, I, I, it's very hard to put myself in that setting and know exactly what I would say, how I would say it. Um, I would still see my job, despite all the social unrest and injustice around, my job as a minister of the gospel is to proclaim the word of God not to be a commentator on all the social events of the day, to expound the word of God. I'm confident that if I was doing that work from a German pulpit, openly, publicly, I would probably end up where Bonhoeffer had ended up, even if I didn't say a single word about Adolf Hitler. Because I would, if I'm expounding the word of God, I would have had to say something about Jews being my about Jews being the subject of evangelism and being my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I would have to say something about the value of human life. And I'd have to be teaching it. Even if I didn't, I, I wouldn't have to go in and... Oh, here's another way to put it. If I'm preaching these things, do I really need to say to my people, now, Hitler's a bad guy? I don't think I actually need to comment on Adolf Hitler if I'm actually preaching the whole counsel of God. Um, so, anyway, I don't know if you want to follow up, but those are, I guess those are a few thoughts in regard to you.
Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess just a, I guess a couple of brief things to follow up. Um, I forgot the first thing I was going to say now. Um, maybe in regard to the, the what, what you just said. Yeah, I. Um, oh, oh, yeah, I remember the first thing I was going to say. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there may be value of distinguishing what is what is proclaimed from the pulpit as the exposition of the Word of God from some of the more general pastoral responsibilities that we have as ministers and elders is that I don't think the pulpit is the place to try to work out all of the micro details of life. But I do think there's definitely a role in our broader pastoral practice. We want to help our people to make wise, to, to live wisely in this world and to put that into practice. And so as a pastor... Uh, you're going you're gonna to talk to people who are, t- who are thinking about, you know, how do I put this in effect t- t- in order to be a really good pastor? Or how do I deal with this difficult situation at work? How do I live in a way that's consistent with this? Or when I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm, watching, I'm watching the news and I'm, 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 I'm exercised about these political issues. How do I think about this? And I don't think the pastor is then going to say, don't talk to me about this. I think the, the, the pastor can say, um, Okay, I, I, I can help. I, I'm happy to help you try to think wisely about this because because that's what it is. It's not like, you know, it, 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 it's not the direct result of biblical exegesis that we know how to handle the difficult situation at work. It's a matter of having wisdom in order to live faithfully in a particular concrete uh, circumstance. And so I think as a pastor, we want to help people to grow in wisdom and to think through things well, without trying to micromanage their lives or to you know, be, you know, to act like, you know, we can make the calls on, 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 on all these difficult things. Um, uh, well, you know, I mean, from the, again, I, 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 have, I have absolutely no problem with talking about abortion as an atrocity from the pulpit. It's just when it comes to the strategy, I just want to, I want to hold back. Uh, so... Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I can see how that 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 could be confusing. I I, um, I, I would affirm certainly that civil governments, ha- as part of having the power of the sword, there's a power to wage war, to to wage lawful war. Um, there are some times when that's that's easy. If your your country is invaded by a hostile power, it's there's no question. But it does. Then there are there are questions about other sorts of wars. So, what I was saying there, I was sort of presuming that someone might make a judgment that an an, an act of going to war is an illegitimate act. This is an act of aggression on the part of my own government. And so, to say that, uh, I mean, we've obviously had some incidences over you know, over the past couple of decades in which th- this issue has arisen. And I, once again, I'm not trying to make comments. I, I'm not try- trying to take a position on the war in Iraq or um, Afghanistan. But, of course, that, that th- these, th- these issues do come up. What is the legitimate exercise of that authority to wage war? So the point I was trying to make there is that someone might make a judgment that 
my country, my, my government is thinking about or has initiated uh, a, a unlawful war and is engaged in the taking of innocent human life. And so I would say that a concern about that could rise to a similar level as a concern about abortion because in both cases we're thinking about um, uh, the, the unlawful taking of life. And one might, I, I don't know, it's... One might also say, and perhaps this gets to your second point a little bit, is that in the case of an unlawful war, it's actually the government itself that is doing the killing. Whereas you might say that in the case of abortion, it's not really the government. The the, the government is is erring by not preventing or punishing the unjust killing, but it's not itself doing it. So, you know, one might say that actually the unjust war rises to a high, but I'm not, I'm not trying to press that case, but I, I think that, that that is a certain issue. I think what we would say is that, what I, I would want to say is that government has the obligation to wield the sword in defense of justice. And that means, that ought to mean, defending unborn human life, and it also means defending its own people from unjust uh, attack and not perpetrating unjust attack. So, yeah, I hope that clarifies what I was saying. Thanks. All right, I, I should get someone who has not asked yet. So, yes, sir. Do you? That's a a good question. Um, uh, Let me try, you know, it's, uh, of course, as a professor, as a scholar, uh, it's very hard for me to give simple yes or no answers. I want to give, like, a whole big background and all that. So, um, you know, as we're thinking about vocations, here, here's a little background before I, I, I answer your question directly. Um, I think there are going to be some there are going to be some easy things. So, 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 there, there, there are easy professions for Christians. A Christian's considering being a nurse. Well, that's easy because we we know that healing and working in in healing is good. So there's no question. Um, there are other things that I think are very easy in the other direction. Does a Christian work as a prostitute? I'm sorry to bring, you know, use it, but I think th- th- there we have a very clear case where it's, 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 we're talking about something that's inherently evil. And so this is not something a Christian, uh, that's probably not the best example because most people in prostitution are really forced into it rather than uh, ch- uh, choosing it. Um, but there are some inherently evil things that Christians should not do. So I guess that, that the question of working at a liquor store, I would say, uh, is 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 uh, is more difficult than those easy ones, because I would say on the one hand, it's not inherently evil to sell someone liquor. Now there may be, I guess this is the Bible Belt, so there are probably some people who would disagree with that. Maybe not here. I don't know. I would say there's nothing inherently evil about drinking alcohol. In fact, it can it can be a good blessing from God to to drink alcohol in. Moderation. So, if it, it, if it's lawful to drink alcohol, it must be lawful to actually produce and sell it. I think where you're going is the fact that we all know that liquor is so often abused, and so often people use it for purposes that are um, that are not uh, uh, licit. Uh, so, how to think about those sorts of things? And actually, you could make that 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 question. More difficult, I think, by saying, is it okay to work at Walgreens or CVS? Um, A lot of things that are sold in a drugstore that are perfectly perfectly good, but some people are going to buy the drugs on the shelf and use them. They might use them to kill themselves. They might use them to make illegal drugs. Um, They might buy condoms off the shelf and use them for... Uh, purposes of sexual immorality. What about that? I would say, uh, in in thinking about these kinds of uh, cases, um, that 
as a general matter, if the act itself is lawful, then I believe we can't prohibit Christians from, from, from doing that. And so I would say uh, selling liquor is not inherently immoral. So I can't say to a Christian, as a general statement, you may not work at the liquor store. And I would say it's the things that are sold at Walgreens or CVS. Do you have, Wal- you have Walgreens and CVS here? Okay, I, you know. Um, I, was, I was trying to think of national chains that, you know, you would know. Um, that, that the kinds of things sold there are lawful things. And just because we know that some people are going to use them in improper ways doesn't mean that I can't work there. I, I'm staying at a hotel. I mean, I think you say the same thing about a hotel. Is it okay to work at a hotel? Some people are going to rent hotel rooms and do things in them that are, that are immoral. But again, I, I would say that... Um, as a general matter, no, I would, I, I would say, yes, it's lawful for Christians to work at such places. Now, I could see certain circumstances. You're working at a liquor store that's only open from 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. on Friday nights in a certain kind of neighborhood or something in which the only valid, you know that the only... The only people that are using this store is to get rip-roaring drunk on the weekends. And I could, I could, there I would, then I think there could be issues of conscience, which is very different from working at a liquor store in which people are dropping in to buy a bottle of wine for their dinner uh, that night. So thank you for the question. I think there are... Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've, I've thought a lot about this, and I, I, I think there are some, 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 some difficult cases, but uh, I hope that gives you a little sense of the way I try to answer that. Okay. Um, Pastor Story, and then, and then, and then so I, I think, yeah, we have time for a couple more here, so. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, the um, uh, for those of you who who uh, who aren't familiar with some of the people that I'm interacting with uh, in my book and sort of implicitly interacting with uh, uh, in my lectures, there's there's a school of thought which is uh, uh, commonly referred to as neo Calvinism or neo Kuyperianism and um, which has emphasized a kind of redemptive transformation that you were asked. I think that was the very first question uh, that, that, that I was asked during this period. And, um, yeah, they have... Uh, it, it's common among those who take this point of view uh, to Christian worldview as, as being summarized by the fact that God made all things, all things have fallen, and all things are being redeemed in Christ. And, and, and that, uh, I don't know, I, I think maybe Herman Doyavird, who was in a, 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 you would certainly know of him, he was a, a very important uh, Dutch Reformed philosopher in the mid-20th century. I think he was the one who first developed this idea, and so it's been picked up by a lot of people since then. And I think what it, um, a, as I see it, uh, what the difficulties with it is that it simply, Okay, I have no problem with the idea of saying God created all things, all things have fallen. That's, there's no debate there. But when they, then they talk about all things being redeemed. And what they, what they usually mean is that all, God is redeeming all things here and now. He's redeeming civil government here and now. He's redeeming our economic structures here and now, etc. 
And so it, it tends to have a, the, the focus of redemption is on the present. And there isn't usually much emphasis upon that, kind of that consummation, that eschatological. It's really the emphasis on redemption here and now of all things. And so uh, one of the reasons why I want to add that, that fourth element, consummation, which I appreciate the fact that you want to do that as well, that uh, it, it's a way of saying that, yes, God is at work, at work redeeming now. But we don't want to, I think we don't want to speak in terms of this uh, kind of a cosmic redemption that's taking place here and now so that redemption, that we can talk about governments being redeemed. I don't think governments are the kinds of things that are redeemed. What I would say is that it's not until the consummation that we see that worldwide cosmic restoration of all things. Um, So... Part of what the kind of neo-Calvinist vision, it, it, it takes different forms in different people, but for a, a lot of them, there's sort of the sense that we're kind of preparing the new creation now. So if, I, if we clean up the polluted river, we're kind of preparing, we're preparing the world for the new creation. If we, you know, if we make a governmental structure more just, we're actually you know, sort of preparing things for the new creation. Here... You know, it, in, in the way that I work things out, I say, I, I don't think that's the way we think about it. Should you be concerned about the polluted river? Sure, be concerned about the pol- polluted river, but not because you think you're going to be swimming in that river in the New Jerusalem. Um, so, uh, I don't know, does that, does that answer your question? Or I don't know if you'd like to follow up. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think you know there. Jesus is. I would say he is. He's addressing the redemptive kingdom. We might say. I mean, he. It, it, it's very clear as as you know that uh, as Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, blessed are you know theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So it's very much about the kingdom. He's not describing earthly political communities. I. Now, that's not often observed among people. I mean, a lot of Christians have tried to bring, to try to make the Sermon on the Mount a kind of a political manifesto, and I would say that's not a legitimate uh, use of it. So when he's talking about the, the city on a hill, we have to say he's talking about the community of the kingdom. He's talking about, about his kingdom as it's manifest here. And that, if you keep reading the Gospel of Matthew, of course, the, I'm talking about Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount because that's where this imagery of the city on the hill is. Um, I think the Gospel of Matthew makes clear that the community of the kingdom here and now is the church of Jesus Christ. So I think he's talking about us as Christians, and specifically the Christians as the church, as this city, uh, as this, as this uh, light to the world. And I really, I, I have to think that, that he's primarily thinking about the proclamation of him the proclamation of him as the one who has come to fulfill the law. I mean, that, that's right in that very same context in Matthew 5. I have come to, f- to fulfill the law. And so I think we're proclaiming the gospel of Christ coming, fulfilling the law, bringing salvation to the world. That's the light of the world primarily. Now, I don't think that we can just write off then the fact that as, as we as Christians live out the kind of vision that the Sermon on the Mount sets forth, as we as individuals and, and as a church community, as we, mo- as, we, as we model that kind of life by God's grace, I think it testifies to Christ and it serves as, uh, as, as a kind of a, a witness that corresponds to our gospel preaching. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I, maybe part of what you're asking is... Um, are, are, are we light of the world, salt of the earth, as we are getting involved in politics or economic development or science or art or whatever? And I would, I guess I would say I'm, I'm a little doubtful that that's what Jesus was really saying there. At the same time, do we as Christians bring good, should we be bringing good things into the world in whatever 
realm of life we're participating? I was saying, absolutely. I, I hope so. I hope that we are, you know, whatever the term we use, that we are a kind of a light, uh, that we do bring a kind of a leaven into the world that is for the good of our, of our neighbor, for the justice of the communities in which we're, we're, we're taking part. Uh, but I am, a, I am kind of skeptical that that's, that that's really what Jesus focuses in the sermon. In Niebuhr's uh, work, you're saying? In my view? Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I guess I would say God himself. God himself is really the point of God. That God is the Lord of both of these. And uh, he's ruling them. I would say there's the same moral law that underlies them. So I think that's another point of contact. Moral law is summarized by, you know, the, the, the Ten Commandments. Uh, so the, the, they get applied and worked out in different ways. I think that's, that's, that's clear as well. But I would say that there's the same, there's the same Lord and the same basic moral structure that, that, that underlies them. And we as Christians, in a way, are a point of contact because we are, called, we are citizens of both. And so... Um, that is a certain point of contact as well. All right, I think. Yeah, I, I, uh, maybe one more question. I saw I saw a hand back, and we're we're coming. I think we're coming up on an hour. So, why don't we make this the last question? Not to try to put too much pressure on you, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I would say that the the gospel is the proclamation of salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ, and that brings our justification, our sanctification, and it brings the hope of everlasting life, the hope of a new creation. That's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I think the fundamental problem with the social gospel is. You know, I mean, it takes different forms in different people, so it's hard to know exactly what people mean when they talk about the social gospel. But traditionally, the, the social gospel tries to, uh, it makes that hope that we have of that everlasting eschatological salvation, something that's realized here and now in our, in our justice system, in our political system, in our economic systems. And... It, it ordinarily then also entails the fact that the church, the, the church's main mission, is to be bringing that that social. Uh, of course, the church is supposed to proclaim the gospel. So, if, if if the gospel is justice in this world, prosperity in this world, um, then it's the church's job to be promoting that. And so, so the social gospel is traditionally held that that this is the church's primary mission is to be working for this justice uh, uh, in the present world. And I would say that there's something fundamentally mistaken about that. Uh, that's, uh, the church is not called to be a social justice organization. Again, as I've, tried, I've, you know, as I've tried to say over and over again, doesn't mean that we as Christians aren't concerned about the things of this world, that we shouldn't be involved in the things of this world. We ought to. Uh, but we can't mistake that for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the, we can't focus on that to the detriment of our everlasting eschatological hope of uh, a new creation. I do think that if, uh, when the church loses a sense of what the biblical gospel is, it's going to look for something else as a gospel. It, 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 I mean, the church needs some kind of good news. And so if it loses the gospel of good news in Jesus Christ... It's going to find. It's going to try to offer good news 
through this worldly means. And I think that's what ends up happening. Um, so I just, I, I, I think the church needs, I think the church always needs to be on its guard uh, about, about that. And um, do we see people tempted in this direction today? Yes, we do. I think we've seen it in all sorts of different ages in, uh, in the church. And so I just think we need to be vigilant and keep proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, let's be involved in, in, in this world, but let's not, let's not confuse those two things. All right. Thank you.